Hey everyone, welcome to another episode. I have a really fun guest today. Her name is Venus and she is a real witch in Salem. Hi Venus. Hi, how are you? Great, thanks for joining me. And you guys, I met Venus when I was in Salem on a retreat uh, this past October, it's 2023, and she gave the most amazing tour. Um, so just tell us a little bit about the place that you work and, and the tours that you do over there. Oh, yeah, totally. So I work at a shop called Stardust Salem. This is actually um, the first year that we're open uh, to the public. And we are an independent witch store. And we also run a tour company out of that, which is Tours for Touring Tourists. Um, I started there as a tarot reader. And after being there enough, I ended up jumping into tour guiding, which when I first came to Salem, that was my first job ever when I was like 18 was doing tours in town. And at Stardust, I just have been able to kind of do a little bit of everything there. So it's been fantastic. And um, I was and you're originally from New York, right? Yes, I am. I'm originally from Long Island. Okay. And so you've been in Salem, I think you said 10 years? Yes, it's 10 years. I came here in 2013 for school. Okay. And then kind of uh, like a lot of people, I just kind of stayed. So um, were you already a practicing witch when you moved to Salem to go to school? Yeah, so I was basically, I like to just tell people I was like born and raised as a witch because my mom, she's been a practicing witch for over 40 years now. And when she had me, it ended up kind of just being a mix of the two. So mm -hmm. I've basically been doing witchcraft my whole life. And what about your father? Was he in, into that or did he think she was a little nutty or how is that? Yeah. So my father was um, a second generation German Jewish immigrant. So he was Jewish and he met my mother and my father um, wasn't super involved in his own personal faith, but um, living in New York, there happens to be a really large Jewish community there as well. Mm -hmm. So I ended up getting a little bit of both of those things, as well as Catholicism, because my mom was initially raised Catholic. So we had just a big spectrum of religions kind of happening in my house growing up. And uh, so what, how did she become interested in, in witchcraft? Was that in her family? It was not. I actually think that, um, so my mother, she graduated high school 1974, and she came from a family of, I believe it was six with one brother, so a lot of women in the house. And it just happened to be the time period, I think, that attracted my mom to not just um, feminism, but metaphysicalism, excuse me. And I think witchcraft kind of went hand in hand with that. So when she ended up kind of going out on her own, I think she just happened to be very attracted to witchcraft for some of the reasons I mentioned. And it just kind of stuck. And then she had me. <laughs> We're just kind of the same, one and the same. Uh, and and uh, are you the, an only child? I am not. I have an older brother, actually. Um, and he also is a practicing witch. My older brother happens to be on the spectrum as well. And it's been really interesting um, just within my family, because I do have a, a mixed family of different disabilities, myself included, how witchcraft also plays a role in the disabled community as well. Because um, it's been, I think, kind of how witchcraft in itself is one of those non-exclusive practices. It's kind of... Um, it's accessible to everybody. So yeah. even though my brother and I were raised the same way, he has a different way of practicing as do I, and it's just completely different things. And you mentioned you're disabled. Is that a, an on the spectrum kind of thing or what? Uh, so I actually have, I was diagnosed in 2020 with multiple sclerosis. So mm -hmm. I have MS, um, which was, you know, really, obviously any type of medical diagnosis is always a lot to handle. Um, but it ended up putting me in a position where uh, faith especially became super important to me because it really changed my whole life as it would probably change anyone's life. But um, it's been uh, very interesting just seeing, uh, I guess, the human ability to adapt 
and kind of survive. It's a crazy thing the, how much people want to survive and want to thrive. Faith is a really powerful thing. That's what I tell people all the time. Yeah, I mean, um, seeing you and you're t doing the tours and stuff, no one would know it. You oh, know. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those um, uh, invisible disabilities, which, uh, you know, everybody I feel like that's in the uh, MS community and just the disability community in general have such a wonderful sense of humor because we're always in so much pain and we're just like, ah, we're fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, there's that gamut. Like we have, I have a neighbor who's has to use a walker, but she's older. She's had it a long time. And then other people, another friend who has been diagnosed with it, but you can't see any symptoms yet. So yeah, yeah. it's different. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting because, um, uh, with MS, what I have, it's a uh, another term that they would call it for years and years was um, uh, snowflake disease because everybody who has it has a completely different set of mm -hmm. symptoms. Yeah, and I was like, you know, that's funny because um, that's kind of how I describe like like in the tour I gave to you uh, witchcraft with people where I'm like, there's kind of one umbrella and then it's all different symptoms all wrapped up into one. And those symptoms yeah. are practice. <laughs> a friend of mine, uh, I told her that I was going to interview you. And she says, well, ask if you have the chance, ask her, what is a witch? What would she say is a witch? So what would your definition be? There's people out there who really get it. They get a bad rap, you know, like, oh, it's evil. Yeah. Devil worshipers. They're eating children, you know. So yeah. what would you Absolutely. say? Um, I believe that a witch is anybody who decides that their form of faith and their form of belief is entwined in something that is not just beneficial for themselves, but for everyone. It's uh, it, it's so interesting because I kind of like to put the question back on people when they're like, what is which? And I'm like, well, you know, ask yourself, what is a, uh, who is a person that pray prays? That is what a witch is. It's if you believe that your intuition is able to kind of guide your life and you're able to give advice to others while giving it back to yourself, then that is kind of what a witch is. There's such a loose term in terms of what witches are. Yeah. Um, you know, the best way I always like to describe it is it's so little to do with religion. Um, uh, I always like to use the example of like yoga where I say witchcraft is a practice, same mm -hmm. way that yoga is a practice. You don't have to be Hindu to practice yoga, and you don't have to practice yoga to be Hindu. They might benefit one another, but one is a practice and one is a belief. That's pretty much it. Right. It's very eclectic. I mean, there's different ones. There's kitchen witches and, and uh, you know, eclectic witches and all sorts of, we had a tour uh, by a, a mu the mushroom witch is what she's called. You probably know. Oh, yeah. yeah. She gave us a tour in the forest and she knows all about the, the mushrooms and the plants of the forest. And then uh, you are um, a kind of a love witch, right? Your, your, your goddess is Venus. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, witchcraft, uh, again, it, it's much more of a practice, but um, so many different forms of witchcraft can also be deity based worship. And I ended up finding Venus. Um, it started when I was a teenager. And I think it was because as a teenager, I was just kind of attracted naturally to things like beauty and love and sexuality and all of those things excited me. Um, but kind of the older I got and the more in tune I got with this particular goddess, um, it was the type of relationship that I found very relatable in a lot of ways, which I think is kind of what we look for in our gods, mm -hmm. or at least I like to think that, where I saw her as, you know, she's the goddess of beauty and love, and yet she struggles with jealousy and she struggles with love. And I just found that... Uh, insanely relatable and i think maybe somewhat of a relatable plight that a lot of women also tend to go through when we're kind of put into this divine feminine role of um acceptance so venus i always just kind of saw as a very um powerful yet relatable figure and i was really happy to kind of start basing my faith around that so and so people who mm -hmm. haven't heard of that, what would it be basing your faith around it? So you have an altar, like what is what does that encompass with you working with her? Yeah, so Venus, um, I something we do at the shop that's really fun um, is uh, we have a display altar. And I kind of, again, you know, as I said, with witchcraft, it's so different. But um, 
you know, an altar is a very basic thing. And a lot of the times people will include the elements like fire and water and air. And that's good for a basic altar. But for myself, you know, I worship Venus. She's the god of opulence and beauty and vanity. So my altar, it started very simple and very basic. But over the years, it just exploded. It's I have a giant um, bust of Venus, like a ship mast bust that's coming out of my wall. I have tons and tons of dried flowers, tons of glitter, tons of jewelry. The way that I basically operate with that is if it's pretty, I put it there. And if it's ugly, I take it away. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of um, how I also treat my worship to Venus. It's the way that I dress, how I do my makeup, my hair. Like I I tell people when I do my tours, I I dress like this every single day. It's it's just another way I like to worship her. And you were um, in pink and red. I think your hat was uh, not even a witch's hat. It was more like a cowboy hat or something. It was more yeah, like, it was like a pink duster pink. hat. Yes. Yeah. And you had pink and red. You're not um, yeah. all in black like some of the witches. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing is like, you know, it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with wearing black for worship. It's a very base neutral color um, because that is technically all colors at once. Um, but at least for me and my relationship with Venus, I feel that um, the best way that I can represent my faith for her and connect with her is by wearing colors that represent Venus, which is reds and pinks and burgundies. And even more so than just the faith connection, whether it's um, a product of that into the other, it just makes me happy to wear those colors. Yeah. So, you know, why not? <laughs> Exactly. And some people, a lot of people, I think they, they, they mistakenly think that like witches are atheists or something like, well, I got, I go to God for, I've had different people saying, well, I go to oh, God, yeah. this and that. And, and when, if they hear you say maybe, well, my worship to her. So are you worshiping her or just a little bit more on that? Like, uh, you know, witches aren't atheists or, uh, and oh, then the yeah. black magic thing too, because they're always going right away to evil. And and so just if we touch on that for people who might be thinking, oh, this is, yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the thing is, it's, it's totally fine because um, one of the benefits I have living in Salem is that uh, overwhelming amount of people come there to learn these things. Mm -hmm. So um, I never find it exhaustive or offensive to explain it to people because a lot of people don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the thing with uh, witchcraft is that so much of it is also based in science. Uh, and I think that's sometimes why atheism gets attached to it. And it, it's funny because I think the average person here is witchcraft and science and they just don't make that connection. But it's very much, witchcraft is kind of a faith practice of the tangible reality using the earth and using the sky, using the stars, you know, stuff that can be proven. And with my worship with Venus, you know, do I have a belief in my mind that one day Venus is going to open up the sky and reach down and grab me? No, I don't believe that. But it's not really about that. It's, um, I believe that when we think of any type of deity, any type of figure, um, the question of whether or not they exist shouldn't really be the question. Because it's if so many people believe in something collectively, now it does exist. Yeah. That's just what it means to be. And I think that um, I always like to use the moon as an example of, um, I think sometimes people get very absorbed in this idea of show me the proof, show me the proof. And I'm like, well, people still struggle to believe in the faith of the moon. And I'm like, well, the moon's right there. <laughs> we could see it with our eyes. So I think it's just, um, I think the same way that uh, maybe a very long time ago, there were things about science that people were extremely skeptical and critical of. I think that we should also be a bit more open-minded to the idea of faith and worship and maybe kind of view it the same way and see that they may, both can exist simultaneously and not denote the other. So that's just how I've always felt. And what I love about it is there's no dogma, there's no rules, there's no book of rules that you have to follow that, you know, you're going to hell if you don't do it, if you do, you know, step out of line. So that's what oh, yeah. I love about it you can create it's a real uh, creation of from your own personality and and you know your kind of your own essence is oh yeah that's something I always um when people are like you know how do I become a witch what does it take what do I do and I'm like I mean you know there's plenty of guidelines plenty of books um you know all the books by Scott Cunningham I always recommend to people I think they're wonderful um but 
at the end of the day, you know, your practice, your belief, your altar is such a deeply personal experience. And there is no right or wrong way to be a witch. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's something that, especially as we've seen with witchcraft getting very popular on social media and stuff, yes. it's already I see this wild kind of gatekeeping aspect that comes into oh, it. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's just at the end of the day, I, I just feel it's, you know, all of us are just trying to exist in a harmonious way. I'd like to think that all witches, regardless of their deity based belief or non belief, we can all agree that we have an energy exchange that we share with one another. So maybe we should just make it good energy. Right. And some are in a coven, you know, they'll be in a, which is a group, like, let's say you have a church group and you go Bible study. It's like, you know, your coven or there's the solitary witches. And so I know how um, Lori Cabot, who is the the official witch of Salem. So I'm going to ask you a little bit about her, but I, I watching some of her videos. She, I mean, she takes it very seriously. She's like, now, if you want to be a witch, you've got to do this, this, and this, she's got it real, you know, to a science there where other people would buy, well, I put my magic into my cooking and I get the herbs from the garden and I have my crystals and I, you know, have my altar and, you know, whatever way you want to do it, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's, you can be you. So, um, yeah, share a little bit about, I loved the story when you talked about Lori Cabot, how witches came to be known to Salem. We know about the Salem witch trials in 1692 and 93, but that was uh, centuries ago. And it's just in the modern era here that it's been, it's like witch city, why it's called witch city and, and oh, yeah. how it came to the 60s and with. Yeah, so I'll let you take yeah. it away. It's such a great, great story. Yeah, of course. It, it's one of my favorite Salem stories. Um, I think that, uh, once again, I think that sometimes Salem gets this uh, uh, criticism, especially, that it faces um, that Salem is profiting off of the uh, mm -hmm. people that were killed during the witch trials. Yeah. And it really is not as black and white as that might appear to people looking on the outside, because the... Um, Salem is known as Witch City, and that actually isn't necessarily because of the witch trials. It's actually when the whole witch trials thing took place, um, Salem was extremely embarrassed by it for very obvious reasons, and they did not want to be known as the city that the witch trials took place in. Um, but unfortunately, when I find things try to get covered up, that's when we end up becoming very familiar with it. So Salem became known as Witch City, ironically, because of the sailors that came here. And when they arrived in Salem, they just went into town and started talking to the locals. And that is when the locals shared with them about the witch trials. And when they got back on their ship and they went to the next port, they would talk about Salem. And when they went there and just over time, they started referring to it as the Witch City, the city of the witch trials, the Witch City, the Witch City. So Salem just started to become known as the Witch City. And this was in the 1800s into the 1900s. And even at that time, though, Salem was known as the Witch City, but we still had not become Salem, Witch City, Salem, yeah. Massachusetts. It still wasn't something we profited from. Yeah. And, you know, the main reason why that happened was because in the 60s, you had, first of all, the publication of The Crucible which is still to this day how so many people know about the witch trials. Um, and then you had uh, the show Bewitched with uh, Samantha Montgomery. Which Elizabeth was, Montgomery, yeah. Elizabeth, excuse me. I think her character's name is Samantha. Yeah, show. Samantha Stevens. Yeah. Samantha Stevens, Elizabeth Montgomery, excuse yeah. me. Um, but that was the first time really that a uh, witch was depicted as, you know, America's sweetheart, as this, mm -hmm. she wasn't ugly. She wasn't this um, hurtful stereotype. She was someone everybody loved. And, you know, they filmed an episode in the town of Salem. And that was kind of when Salem started to notice that we could potentially, you know, if we kind of embrace this witch thing, if we kind of embrace this social thing, maybe we could get some money from this. Maybe we could turn into a tourist town. But even still, Salem had not yet come to that point where people like myself and people like uh, the witch shops you saw in town and all the different stores, those still did not exist. And really the main reason why Salem became kind of this safe haven for witches was because of Lori Cabot, who's the head witch of Salem and still is today. And when she arrived here, 
uh, at the beginning of the 70s, she was a practicing witch. And at that time, it still really wasn't an okay thing to be. Even now, it still isn't an okay thing to be, depending on where you are in this world or in this country. Mm -hmm. And when she was here, she was a closeted practicing witch. And at the time, um, she happened to own a cat, which uh, I talk about familiars and things like that. Familiars was this belief that witches were given... Exactly. If you ever wondered why witches are associated with black cats or owls or spiders, it's yeah. because the Puritans believe that uh, witches were given servants of the devil and they were given like basically little henchmen to do their bidding which would be in the form of the animals i listed and lori cabot had a cat it was just her pet cat um but one day the cat got out of her house and ran up a tree in her front yard and when she called the fire department she tried to get them to get the cat out and the cat never came out and they basically told her i'm sorry lady we can't help you out you know just wait for it and finally, she got so fed up, finally, she called them back and she said, my name is Lori Cabot. I am a practicing witch. My familiar is stuck in a tree and I need you to come here and get him out. And that was when they sent everybody to Lori Cabot <laughs> to get the cat out of the tree. And that was when they published in the newspapers the next day, it said, witches in Salem. And now it was literally the metaphorical and literal cat was out of the bag. Mm. And once it's out of the bag, you can't go back in. And that was when Salem, not just in the town, but now around the world became known as a safe place for modern day witches. Mm -hmm. And that was when we had this great migration of witches coming to Salem. And it was after that, uh, Lori Cabot, she opened the Crown, the Crow, uh, excuse me, the Cat, the Crow and the Crown, which was the oldest witch shop in the country. And then she ended up staying in Salem. Now she resides in Enchanted, where she basically hangs out. And that was ultimately why now Salem has places like Stardust, like the shop that I work at. And that's why we were able to have not just one tour company, but multiple tour companies and multiple shops where you could walk in and pick up a book on love magic or a book on mushroom magic or kitchen magic. And it's really just Salem has such a wonderful and exciting just never ending circumstances of events that lead to why the town has become what it is. And it really, I think at the end of the day, makes Salem even more magical that these things happen. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, believe the hype about Salem because we actually are kind of like a Disney movie. <laughs> Isn't it? And um, so Lori Cabot is like 90 now. She's- Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, I didn't see her walking around, but you know, I'd hear that you could see her and she wears the, garb you know the beautiful long you know robes and oh, yeah. the, all of that stuff so oh, I, yeah. yeah it's so magical now do you find that uh coming to Salem is welcoming like let's say you're a new witch in town and you want to move there and start you know are people uh welcoming or are they like oh we've got enough already or who are you or don't move in on us or how how would it be it's, um, you know, I certainly think that um, Salem, first and foremost, is always going to be a small New England town, um, even if we have the witch community here. And I think that um, there is quite a bit of diversity in Salem in terms of our witchcraft community. And, you know, once again, it's that benefit that there are so many different shops and there are so many different things that it is... You know, and uh, something that we've also been trying to do at Stardust is we'd like to have more open classes and more open shops and more beginner 101 things like that. That's also something I've been trying to do on my own site um, because it is kind of difficult or it is intimidating when you move here first thing to try and find, you know, what part of this is for the community and what part of this is for tourism. Uh, and it does exist. It f absolutely does. It's just um, we like to try and make it a little uh, easier so that, you know, people like myself, it did take me some time to find my community here. Um, just because I think with any belief, anything like that, any type of religion or anything that's similar to that, you always want to be discerning and you want to make sure you're in with the right people. Yeah. So I'd say yes, but also no, if, if that makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And and your husband works at the shop with you, right? Yes, absolutely. And that's um my husband is also a practicing witch. Mm-hmm. So it we just happened to we didn't meet on like a witch dating app or anything. It just happened to happen to be a thing we had in common. And uh-huh. um uh Nick and I he ended up when I started working at Stardust, I would basically come home all the time and just let him know how wonderful it was. And back in the day, he used to also be a tour guide in town. Everybody who's lived in Salem, I feel like, has either worked as a tour guide at one point or has been in the service industry. And he ended up um, just saying, oh, you know, I'd like to pick up some shifts there if I can. And that was last October. And it was just great. I love working with him. Did you meet him in Salem? Or have you? Yes, I did meet him in Salem. I met Nick in Salem in, oh, wow, um, 2016. There okay. we go. Yeah. Yeah. And um, okay, so let's talk about your tarot. So ma- basically, uh, I think you said your the main thing that you do is is tarot readings. That's for uh, besides working at the shop and tours, your work is tarot. Yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. Did you learn that tarot. as a child. Did your mom teach you? Have you, Have you been doing that? Yes, my mom um, has been a tarot reader uh, my whole life. That's also one of the things she does full time as a job. Um, and my mom ended up teaching me because I showed an interest in it. And it's really, when I, it's really fascinating because when I try to think back on how my mom taught me, I sincerely can't remember. It just kind of feels like it just happened somehow. Um, because there's certain cards for sure that my mom definitely imprinted upon me as like, this is what it means. Um, and then the rest just kind of ended up being practice, um, I think tarot, just like witchcraft, um, there is kind of a set and guideline to it. But I think so much of it is depending on your personal relationship to it and the relationship that the person you're sitting with has with it. Um, You know, I I believe so strongly in respecting people's autonomy, um, especially when it comes to things like their future or their past or their inner monologue. So that's always something I try to... um, be very mindful of when I give people readings just because, you know, that's their business. <laughs> and if they're, if they want to give it to me, I appreciate it. You know, yeah. I, I tell people all the time that um, the way I've always viewed tarot is it's like, if it's like a mirror, um, if you could have a conversation with your reflection, what would your reflection say back to you? And I think oftentimes that that internal monologue being reflected can actually predict the future but I think it's because sometimes I think we're a bit so um, maybe just caught up in everything in life and all of the distractions and all the stimulus. Sometimes it's very difficult for us to take, to take the time to actually connect with our own thoughts. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes if we have the ability to, like I said, kind of do that shadow work and look at ourselves, we actually do see like the light at the end of the tunnel. We see what the clear and obvious answer is. Yeah. which, you know, for some people does come across as telling the future. But it's something that I do is I like to let people know, like, that's them doing it, not me. Mm-hmm. Um, I was translating what the cards that they picked said. Mm-hmm. So I just I try very hard to remove my own personal like, oh, make sure you keep coming back to me. Like it's want to give them I, the power. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think that, um, like I said, it's a. Uh, one one of my most memorable readings I did was for a young man who afterwards he told me that he was a therapist. He was a new therapist. And he said that he had never gotten a tarot reading before, but he saw so many similarities in what he did as a cognitive behavioral therapist and some of the things that I did in the reading, which is it's presenting a question and kind of redirecting the question back so that the person that's receiving it is able to kind of digest it and work through it on their own. And at least for me, that's always been kind of my relationship with tarot, which is a tool to kind of help people get through the blocks that they're in in their life at the moment. Um, At least I'd like to think that. Yes. And then do you, uh, do you uh, work on you? Well, do you see things too, like flashes? Do you get ever get uh, mediumship coming through or, what other things happen for you or are you it's um i say 
And I think a big part of it does also come from my um, Venus worship, the venereal worship, is I exist so strongly in the corporeal realm. Um, but I get, I certainly get flashes, and it happens during specific readings um, where, and I don't, even I still am like, I'm not sure where it's coming from, but it's just very strong messages I get um, on certain cards, especially. Uh, like, and I, it's not always predictable. Sometimes it just happens. And I think a big part of that is the actual connection or the empathy of the person across from me. I think so much of what I feel exists on another person's empathy. And when I get these really strong messages, I feel like it must be a part of them in their own mind. They're screaming this and I'm hearing it somehow. Um, because very rarely when I get those messages, it has to be very persistent for me to actually voice it out loud. Um, and it's usually always something that resonates very deeply with the other person. Um, there was an example I did where I pulled this one card. It was the King of Cups card. And before I said anything about the card, I was just like, does the military mean anything of importance in your life? And then she just kind of went off about her fiance. And then when she, when I kind of was able to see everything together, I was like, oh my gosh, this whole reading has been about her fiance mm. and everything makes sense now. And that's what I tell people in readings. I'm like, just so you know, like I'm also experiencing these discoveries real time with you, <laughs> like a translator. That's what I tell people. And so you do uh, readings in the shop and then if someone wants to, they do it, can do it over the phone or do you do Zoom or how else, could, if someone's not there in Salem, how can you do readings? Oh yeah, them? so I basically, I do all the above. I do Zoom, um, if they're iPhone users, I'm happy to do things like FaceTime. Um, mm -hmm. I've done phone readings before. It's really um, whatever the person is comfortable with uh, is kind of what I always say. Um, you know, right now, of course, I do it in person at Stardust, uh, but I also do events and things like that. I did a couple weddings like last year, which was a lot of fun yeah. um, and parties. But uh, for like my, my main clientele, it's mainly I found Zoom is how they reach out to me. Um, and that obviously I can reach people or people can reach me rather through my Instagram or through my site, which is under construction, but it's gonna be up by Christmas time. So okay. that should be great. Wonderful, yeah. So while I'm flashing your Instagram up on the screen, it's oh, Venus in Salem, right? Yeah. And That's let's talk a little bit about the hauntedness. I did some ghost uh, uh, sleuthing there when I was there, our group. And and uh, one one thing that was interesting we did, we went in the, there's a woman who gives tours. It's under, it would be underneath right where they had the witch trials. It would be above. So I don't know what building that is, but we go, it's almost industrial down there and you go in different rooms and it's, it's dark and we have different uh, items like a, a witch box or a voice, not a witch box, but a ghost box where oh. if there's, they have these different radio stations that'll go really fast. So it sounds like. Ch -ch -ch. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very fast. And then you can hear voices coming through because it's this white noise. And uh, I, at one point I was holding it and we, our group was there and we had been asking, you know, Hey, you know, can you come? Isn't everybody there? Anybody there? And finally we had to leave and I'm holding it and we're all sitting around. And I said, well, I mean, I guess if, you know, you didn't want to talk, we, we got to go. So I said, good night. And this male voice comes out through it and goes, good night. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it was really great. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's a fun place. And then we had some other tours where we'd hear about different hauntings and what's your favorite uh, haunting story or have you seen anything or have had anything happen there? Or... Oh yeah. No, it's um so even though I'm a person that I I don't have a personal relationship with ghosts, I absolutely believe in them. Um, and as respectfully as possible, I'm very afraid of ghosts. So I try not to mess around with them. Um, but Salem has had so many like fascinating stories. Uh, one of my favorite stories always surrounds um, the merchant uh, in Salem, where it's uh, the body of Sheriff George Corwin, who was a during the witch trials, he was the police officer and he was 
one of the worst, like one of the absolute worst. The he was just just a nasty guy. And um, as a matter of fact, he was so nasty that when he died, they basically had to hide his body because they were afraid people would literally like tear his body apart. Mm. So they ended up burying him in the basement of his home. And that home ended up becoming the Hotel de Merchant, which is still in Salem now. Mm-hmm. And um, it wasn't until like, it was something like a hundred years or so after he died that they ended up like finding him and they were like, oh my God. And there's still stories about his ghost haunting that place. And the thing is, I'm always inclined to believe that any type of death that occurred in secrecy or anger or fear absolutely leaves this stain of energy. And I feel that, I think that's probably where my fear of ghosts comes from because I feel like that stain of hatred is so intense that it just leaves a mark. So that always was my favorite scary story because that's like, I, I know there's some people that probably be like, oh, I want to go into the basement of the merchant. And I'm like, I absolutely do not want to do that. Why would you ever want to do that? <laughs> but, yeah, things like that. And again, with the t- town of Salem, you know, we have so much unfortunate and painful history with the witch trials. And I think that there's so much of it that just, it doesn't just go away. It's the energy. Right. It's the exchange of the two. So what, when I think of... Uh, Spooky ghost stories in Salem. I think Sheriff Corwin is probably my favorite in terms of again scary. So and we visited the spot where the people were hung, yeah. Proctor's Ledge. Yes, we and the names are uh, below that. And then we walked up, and there was a few trees, but the spot was there. And then on the tree, there's the names of each person. So we kind of formed a circle and get, just uh, had some reverence. Uh, for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very interesting to stand where that happened. Um, Oh, yeah. Although it's very changed around it, you know, that, but you could just kind of picture everybody coming and standing there. And, and um, yeah, so that was it it feels it's interesting to really get to see, because it's so long ago that there's actual some structures that still exist or spots that they know of that you can really um, kind of tap into. And yeah, yeah, and, and the cemetery and all of that, cemeteries. Yeah, it was the, um, the Witch Trials Memorial was also so um, impactful, the way that it was built, because it was all of the pieces of it. It's basically like stacked bricks almost, and it was done intentionally, the memorial, to show that nothing is ever permanent and that things always change. And it was supposed to reflect this idea that hysterias will always happen because Mm -hmm. nothing is stationary. Things are always changing. And it means that, you know, you could take one piece out of it and after time, it will just become another piece of the earth. And it was like so profound and impactful for just the legacy of Salem and the history of the witch trials and um, just the reality of these you know, not unlike people who practice witchcraft, these people who didn't practice witchcraft, but their faith was so important to them that they died for it. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, you know, I think that uh, once again, it goes back to that idea of, is it disrespectful for Salem to do that? And I say no, because I think it's better to have this opportunity for people to learn and experience that and be humbled by it than have it be forgotten by history. Yeah. So even the police on their car, the side of the car, it's a wit, uh, witch on a broom and it says yeah. on their on their patch on their uniform. Everything is witch city here, witch city yes. plumbing, witch city, um, the high school, they're the witches. It's like literally yeah. it is Salem. Wow. Salem is witches. So that was my one of my bucket list trips. I always wanted to go to Salem in the month of October. And so when my shaman Riz Mirza, he gives a uh, sacred Uh, retreats all over the world and he says well uh, October in March I was at the Sedona one and he says we're doing Salem in October and I signed up right away so it was 11 women and we stayed in Manchester by the sea in a hundred year old villa 10 10 um, room villa and uh, we did he did a seance one night in there in the villa and we just did 
so many things. It was it was amazing. It was a it was a trip that I'll never forget. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that's um, I don't know anyone who's visited Salem and has been like, I hated it. Like everyone, they seem like it was everything and more they could have asked for. Yes. It makes me happy as someone who works in the tourism industry. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you guys, if you go to Salem, you have to look up Venus, go to her shop, go to on the tour, get a reading from her. I'll put all her information in the show notes and let us let us know in the comments. Have you, what do you think about witches? Are you a witch? Have you been to Salem? Is it on your bucket list like it was for me? Do you read tarot? Let us know what you're doing there. <laughs> do you have a black cat? I bought this cat, you guys, in Salem at the Ouija board museum. And uh, it was uh, just, it looks so real, doesn't it? You guys look, look at this guy. Ooh. <laughs> I just love it. All right. Thanks, Venus. Thank you for stopping by. Much of love, course. everybody.